Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. I'm Andrew Schneider, politics and government reporter for Houston Public Media, filling in for Gary Poland. And I'm David Jones, still here, uh, and happy to be here with Andrew Schneider. And of course, we've got a couple of guests who kind of know what they're talking about. Yeah, today we'll be talking about the upcoming Texas primary election, and here to talk about some of the candidates and the issues, we have Brandon Roddinghouse, professor of political science at the University of Houston, and Jay Iyer, Assistant Professor of Public Administration at Texas Southern University. And they are the co-hosts of the Party Politics podcast on Houston Public Media. So let's uh, start at the top of the ticket. Let's uh, look at where things stand in the governor's race. Well, on the Democratic side of things, I think it's um, presented a more interesting race than we thought it would be. You definitely have, I think, a sense of the wings of the party being very active. And whoever wins, I think, will give us a sense of kind of what the future of the party looks like. You've got Lupe Valdez on one hand, who's the sheriff of Dallas County and former sheriff of Dallas County, and uh, who hasn't raised a lot of money, but who is more experienced politically. You've got Andrew White also running, who is a businessman and here in Houston, and who is the son of former governor. Mark White, who and presents a, Harvey, a more moderate. A Harvey hero. He is. No, and, and he's used this in his ad as a way to kind of connect to people. So we've got a difference in styles. We've got a difference in tactics. And so I think politically speaking, we also have some differences there too. White slightly more moderate. Lupe Valdez slightly more 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 progressive. So I think that that play out is going to be really interesting. As it is now, polling suggests that she's ahead, but that can change. Yeah, right now the polls seem to indicate that she's got sort of a comfortable lead about 15 to 20 points, depending on, on what you what you want to look at. Mm-hmm. The big issue here is I think she's got some basically some institutional advantages. We know that the composition of the electorate statewide traditionally has has benefited Latino, Latino surnamed candidates, Spanish surnamed candidates. Um, and she certainly has that. And obviously, as, as, a, as a woman, she has a certain advantage there. So she starts off the race, I think, to some extent with probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 28 to 35 percent of the vote. Andrew White is essentially a political unknown. He's raised a lot more money than she has. She's raised essentially nothing. Um, he, and he's also donated or, or given to lent his own campaign about a million dollars. But I think the big issue here is just been her performance as a candidate. Um, it's been, I think, by all accounts, astoundingly bad. Um, she's been criti- heavily criticized by editorial boards. She's lost all major endorsements uh, from, from this, her hometown paper in Dallas to the paper in San Antonio and in Houston um, and not received a lot of support that way. It's kind of an interesting, and Brandon and I've talked about this before, this interesting sort of dynamic where she was brought into the race in large part as kind of a pushback against folks who thought Andrew White was a little too moderate, a little too conservative. Well, it won't be the first time that if it goes into a runoff with those two, that a minority candidate without any money defeats a well-funded Anglo candidate. happened when uh, Johnny Bryant was running, uh, lost to the teacher from Dallas, named Morales. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, a friend of mine named John Odom was uh, in, a, in a runoff with a lesser funded candidate named Dan Morales, and he lost to him. So, yeah. so how much would White's money count in a runoff against Valdez's name recognition? Oh, I, th- I think it could, it could count a lot. The electorate mix changes dramatically in a runoff. The big issue is, is that there's a time lag. The runoff's not till May. So you're almost you've got a, you've got almost like a two month period of time. So the ability to raise money gives them more time to campaign. I I suspect she's I, I think that's when you're going to probably see her kick it in as far as a campaign goes. Try to raise more money ag- against him. I mean, he's got problems among sort of one of the core constituent groups, which has been the the the, the, the pro choice community, um, and they are backing her. And I think in a runoff election, they certainly would would work against him. And there's no debating the fact that I think. Uh, Greg Abbott would much rather run against Lupe Valdez and Andrew White. And there's no debating the fact that Greg Abbott has far more money than anybody could ever use in any campaign. Yeah. And uh, I don't think he's worried one way. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. In fact, in fact, yeah. uh, what is Greg Abbott doing? Yeah. Knowing that he doesn't have a race, knowing that the Democrats are likely to. Uh, uh, nominate somebody that he will slaughter. Yeah. Uh, what well, is he doing with his time? He's laughing all the way to the bank for one. I mean, he outraised everybody in the field, including every other Republican. He's got $20 million in the last year. He's got $45 million in the bank. So he's definitely sitting pretty. That's him, I think, in a good position to be able to help other Republicans that he likes. So he has spent a lot of time communicating with Republicans in certain key districts that 
are currently held by incumbents who he views as not being conservative. What so, is his What is his standard that he yeah. used to judge <laughs> these, these? Did you vote with me or not? Exactly. Did you introduce legislation I didn't exactly. like or not? That's I think his standard. Yeah, here in here in here in Harris County, I mean the the sort of the the singular person he's focused his ire against is is uh, Sarah Davis yeah. in House District 134. Um, he is backing heavily uh, a woman named Susanna Dokopil, who is a ch challenging Sarah Davis, uh, and he's putting out money, he's putting out campaign ads that he's directly funding. Yeah. Um, and large, in large part, I think it's been you know her position or closeness to, to Speaker Strauss and, and her position on things that he was, uh, was uh, unhappy about. Yeah. In, um, not, not, no, notably, I think, is the, uh, the ethics bill. Yeah. Lyle Larson, who is a representative out of San Antonio, is also feeling the heat from the governor. He introduced that legislation that would have limited the governor's ability to appoint people to people who hadn't given over a certain amount of money, and that's something that the governor didn't like. He also has been involved in a local race here uh, out of Galveston, Wayne Faircloth, the Fair, Faircloth District, uh, who's been, he's being challenged by Mays Middleton, who is a well-funded um, Tea Party, Empower Texas-backed um, candidate. So the governor's really, I think, uh, definitely used his money and used his influence to try to expand the reach of the governor's office, but also to try to put his own brand on the party. And that's something that he hasn't done as well as like Dan Patrick has done. How much of a risk does he run doing that, yeah. though, if the people that he is uh, challenging wind up getting reelected and he has yeah. to face them in the next legislature? <laughs> <laughs> it gets awkward, right, in, in 2019. I think it definitely is uh, somewhat problematic for the governor, um, but given the numbers the Republicans have, it's unlikely it's going to make a material difference in terms of his ability to negotiate. But I do think that there's going to be some backlash in 134 in particular, Sarah Davis's district. A lot of those Republicans are moderate Republicans. They like Sarah Davis, and they don't like the fact that the governor's involved in and this. And they so, want their kids vaccinated. Well, <laughs> that's partly too. Uh, and I think that the fact that the governor really injected himself into that could be a problem. But I think it's less of a problem in Faircloth's district or in Lyle Larson's district, where he definitely could be a persuasive element to getting some of the more conservative voters to turn out who they perceive to be more liberal Republicans. And he's trying to make a statement, right? Because he's yeah. picked these three for very, a very particular reason. He probably can be make a difference in two of them and maybe not in the third one. But win or lose, he's sort of laid out a marker that I'm going to try to dominate uh, and get my agenda through it in the next legislative session. He knows he's going to be back. He's by far the most popular statewide elected official, and he wants to, as we say, sort of, you know, he wants to, to, to pr project that out on the party, kind of reshape it in his image. Before we get to the Senate, can we talk about, because early voting has started, mm -hmm. ends on March the 2nd, I believe, uh, and we, there are numbers that you guys are good at in, in analyzing. And analyzing. And so tell us what the first day's voting tells you about the, uh, in, the, the uh, inspiration of parties, say, or intensity, yeah. intensity, yeah, sure. uh, how, however it you... It is the blue wave comment. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so I think, like, we'll talk about Harris County first, but, I mean, they, we had a great first day uh, in terms of voting. Um, overall, uh, the Democratic turnout was about up about 300 percent from, uh, from 2014. Uh, the Republican vote was up about 25 percent uh, from from 2014. Both sort of went up, uh, I think, pretty dramatically. But on the Democratic side, it was just massive. The, one of the key indicators is always request for mail ballots. That has a tendency, to, I think, to indicate sort of how much is sort of pent up. Also, organizational structure. It can. Uh, it, it's when you 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 can't make it there on election day. You may not be able to vote, but you want to be able to vote, so you request these ballots. For Republicans, they're essentially requesting um, at the level of a presidential election. Um, for Democrats, it's off the charts. Um, there's over 30,000 requests and still counting because you can request all the way up until the 22nd of February. So you've got a lot of energy on the Democratic side. You've got actually plenty of energy on the Republican side, but it's just not met at the same level. So right now, I'm not sure we're going to see a sort of a blue wave as much as the state is definitely much more in contest than I think some people might have thought. How much of this can we put yeah. down to a particular race as opposed to, you know, general feeling about the state of the country and, and which which general party they'd like to see have control? Yeah. You know, Jay's right. Harris County is booming in terms of the number of Democrats coming to vote, in part because we've got several competitive races here. CD7 uh, is one. CD, uh, CD29 is another. So there are a lot of Democrats who are pushing Democrats to go vote. So that's part of it. 
I think, generally speaking, a couple of bellwethers are important. In counties that are already pretty Democratic, you see turnout increase. Not 300% like we saw in Harris County, but I think Harris County probably artificially is low, so there's a lot more room to grow. In places where Republicans are otherwise good and strong, those numbers are a little laggard, so they're not quite as good as uh, you might think. So I think the Democratic enthusiasm is definitely going to spike, and that's going to be um, something that carries them over. My bellwether county is Jefferson County, which is where Beaumont and Port Arthur are. And we see day one totals for the Democrats at about 600 voters and for Republicans about 200. So that is a 50-50 split in terms of the last election, 50 percent to Trump, 50 percent to Clinton. So if there is an opportunity for Democrats to be able to move in a direction of being able to be competitive, it's going to happen in these counties where there's more of a purple quality. And Jefferson County suggests that there's that movement. Yeah, to that point, my, my bellwether is is sort of a different tact. It's Fort Bend County, which is incredibly diverse, but it's suburban in nature, not necessarily sort of traditionally sexist. Same phenomena. Democratic turnout is surging there, as is Republican turnout is strong as well. But the gap there is is much less than it has been in the past. And so that's been, to me, the big issue. Okay. So Harvey displaced a great number of people. Apparently, this is not making much of a difference in terms of uh, who's turning out to vote. I mean, I, I understand that thousands of people were turned out of their homes, and I don't know whether they've re-registered or what efforts are being made to find them, uh, and uh, whether or not they're uh, on anybody's radar screen. Well, we don't know right now because we, we're just looking at sort of sort of four projections of kind of first day and then and, and what's, what's happening in the mail. So we're not going to know what the totals are. We know that generally in these midterm elections, about 35% is, is a high number for these kinds of elections. We, statewide, we've always gone about 55% on presidential cycles. So, so we don't exactly know what's going to happen right now as it relates to Harvey, but so far it looks like it hasn't had the, the negative effect, at least from an organizational perspective. How, how much of an effect would you say, though, that Harvey is having as an issue as, yeah. opposed to, as opposed to just in terms of people being able to get to the polls? It's definitely become a big issue. I think that the 7th Congressional District, where John Culberson is the incumbent, you have seen several of the candidates on the Democratic side hammering him over the inability of government to be able to respond adequately to Harvey. Now, it's not all his fault, but he definitely gets the blame because he's the incumbent and he's a member of a, an unpopular party uh, and by, by the terms of those Democrats. So it's becoming a big issue. In terms of the mechanics of getting people who are displaced to vote, the campaigns in that district have thought about that. The ones who've got a good field operation are definitely reaching out to make sure that their candidates are well backed by the people who are uh, in that in that area and they've spent a lot of time trying to make sure the people who are displaced can vote. So it definitely is an issue both from a political perspective but also I think from a mechanical perspective. What do you as political analysts think is the way that some of these voters are going to be deciding who to vote for? You know, there's there's two things that come to mind for me. One is they'd probably like to know what some independent observer thinks about who the best candidates are and the only one that you know, is widely spread is the Chronicle endorsement. And then you have on the Republican side, you have uh, three slates, uh, conservative slates, and you have opposition from a group of young Republicans called Trash the Slates because they're claiming it's a pay-to-play scam to get on one of these uh, slates. So, you know, who, what do they take into the voting booth because they don't know who all these right. people are? So, yeah, so the dynamics in the two parties are a little bit different. I, I think on, on the Republican side, it's traditionally been the strength of these sort of three slates. And there's been some call to question because on the slates themselves, the accusation has been is that candidates essentially have to pay in order to be placed on the slate. On the Democratic side, it's always traditionally been You've also had slates, but they've been they've been non, they've been endorsement processes. So um, uh, HGLPC, um, the Houston Gay Lesbian uh, PAC, has been a very powerful um, advocate for it, and their slate card is actually very popular among progressive voters. AFL-CIO has put out slate cards in the past. Um, Coalition of Black Democrats has done a similar kind of slate. Uh, on, on the Democratic side. So you have that, but those, the accusation there has not been on, on a pay, pay to play system. And so that's what you're seeing on the Republican side. The Chronicle has always been kind of, it can, can cut both ways. It has not been an effective tool for Republicans in the past because there's a tendency, I think, sometimes to view it as a moderate entity. Um, I think it does have much more play on the Democratic side, though. I've got one word 
Trump. Right? <laughs> On both sides, that works, right? Republicans love him, Democrats hate him. Some of the recent polling that came out suggests that 80% of Republicans approve of his job, whereas 80% of Democrats don't. So he is the most polarizing figure we've seen. But he's, I think, done more to reshape the Democratic Party than he has to reshape the Republican Party. So the turnout that's been spiking for Republicans that where it has been, I think has been in response to a kind of defense of Trump, but also probably a little bit of priming from Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and from Governor Abbott. But for Democrats, it's all about Trump, right? They want him to be shown a message that they are not happy with where things are going. Okay, so we've talked now about two major figures that have a, a potential to influence down ballot races. We've talked about Governor Abbott. We've mm -hmm. talked about Donald Trump. We have to talk about the Senate race. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously, Senator Ted Cruz and Congressman Beto O'Rourke each have primary opponents. They're each viewed by far as the favorite for their party, which raises the question then, once these two people are formally uh, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. not to get ahead of yeah. myself, yeah. but you know, Assuming if, uh, if, yeah. and, if, and, if and when they are named the official candidates of their respective parties, what are the big issues that are likely to dominate the race? Yeah, I think um, in terms of the strategy, I think that O'Rourke definitely has got a tactical approach that will be successful for Democrats in 10 years, but maybe not 10 months, right? He wants to build the base. He has been effective at rallying people to a more progressive cause. Immigration has been one issue. I think he's definitely worried about the distribution of wealth in this country. That's another one, clearly against the border wall. So he's tried to rally Democrats in a way that, um, that we haven't seen happen for a, a good 10 years. His fundraising numbers show that that's working. He's raising a lot of money from a lot of different people. The average donation is between 40 and $50. So the fact that he can regenerate that, I think, is uh, certainly something that makes uh, the Democrats um, happy because it shows that there is a potential for a grassroots base. But in terms of beating Ted Cruz, it's going to take a lot more than that to be able to take down Titan. Yeah, he's, he's trying to thread the needle, yeah. uh, uh, Beto O'Rourke is. He's trying to essentially use traditional progressive issues like immigration, like the environment, mm -hmm. to try to rally sort of base supporters um, in, in some of the large urban counties. But he's also, I think, trying to reach out to suburban counties. He spent a lot of time in places like Montgomery and Fort Bend that normally Democrats don't go to, in large part because he's trying to convince suburban voters that he is an acceptable alternative. He is a, he, that he appears more moderate than he is. That's one of the reasons why when he led off his campaign, he talked a lot about veterans issues. He talked about the, his commitment to, to veterans. He's from West Texas, from El Paso. The biggest challenge he has is that not a whole lot of people know who he is. His favorables are actually quite good, but at least 65% of the voting populace still doesn't know who Beto O'Rourke is. So while he's raising a lot of money and he's trying to do essentially two things at one time, be more progressive to progressives, but he's also trying to show himself as a moderate mainstream Democrat to everyone else. And the liberal Democrats aren't happy about it. Remember, right. he came to fame in part because he had this bipartisan road trip with one of his other fellow members of the House, Will Hurd, who's a Republican, a moderate Republican. So they couldn't get back to D.C., so they literally road tripped from El Paso, from San Antonio, all the way across to D.C., and they had a kind of Facebook live stream the whole way. And it was really interesting to watch and heartening to see bipartisanship in Washington. But the Democrats said, when are you going to say something bad against, against Will Hurd. And the Republicans said, why are you road tripping with this horrible Democrat? So there's, I think, a kind of larger issue here, which is that the parties are really polarized. And it's hard to be able to find that moderate middle. So like Jay said, O'Rourke's trying to thread that needle, but that's not where the kind of primary electorate is. Well, well Leo, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, it's the, I mean, it raises an interesting question, which is that, you know, we still O'Rourke's problem is that not a lot of people know who he is. Cruz's problem for a long time is that pe people exactly. know who he is, but they don't necessarily like right, him. Right, too many people probably like him. He's, <laughs> right. he's a fascinating, the more people yeah. know him, the less they tend to like him. And so you've got this di sort of this dynamic where he's, he's you know, his, his unfavorables are higher than his favorables, which is never a good sign for an incumbent. Republicans are troubled by him. And that, in large part, stems from his opposition to Trump mm -hmm. at some point. And so you've got this weird combination of, of, a, of a very conservative Republican who is less popular among Republicans than certainly Governor Abbott. And, and it also, uh, I'd have to bring, bring up that uh, Beto is a progressive white guy, all right? And I don't know, you, you can tell me what, what chances 
progressive liberal white guys have in general elections in Texas. And especially when we know that the composition of the Democratic primary electorate is probably 65 percent minority. I think it's going to be the case that he is going to be painted as uh, a liberal who's out of step with Texas. Maybe that's exactly what they'll say, right? I don't know how true that is because obviously these positions are all nuanced, but he could be painted as somebody who's too liberal. I think that's probably the starting point. But he is a candidate to have some other vulnerabilities too. He has an arrest record. He was part of a punk rock band, which you know, in some ways is endearing, but in a lot of ways makes him look like he's a little bit unusual as a candidate. So contrast that with Ted Cruz, then I think you've got um, some dynamics that don't necessarily favor all work. And I think for Cruz, he has to figure out who he is. I mean, I think part of the problem was that Ted Cruz 1.0 was a kind of rabble rouser, somebody who was going to go to Washington and change it. And then after the election, he became Ted Cruz 2.0, who was going to be more you know, engaged in the lawmaking process and make a difference. Then he went back to Ted Cruz 1.0, where he voted against uh, some of the legislation um, on immigration to be able to initiate debate. So there's, a, I think, a kind of identity crisis he's facing. And until he figures that out, I don't know that he can really capture any one particular part of the Republican Party. Jay, maybe you can address the minority population of of the Democratic Party and how dominant it is, and especially if you see what the local Democratic Party is doing. It is addressing every function, it seems, and I went to one recently where only minority spokespeople are presented. I mean, you know, none of the Anglo Democrats running for Congress at this big dinner that the Democrats held were even introduced before a crowd of 1,300 people. So, so, so yeah. it was everybody, until they got to Nancy Pelosi, was um, either African American or Latino. Well, look, so there's no do- denying that sort of identity politics has been a driver in the Democratic Party uh, to, to some extent. I think in the case of O'Rourke, the issue you're talking about would really, I think, only play in a Democratic primary. He doesn't really have a serious primary challenge. And I think he himself is a unique candidate. He's, he is essentially, uh, while he is, he is Anglo, he's represented a predominantly Latino district. His entire career is his city council uh, uh, constituency in El Paso was, was also predominantly uh, Hispanic. He speaks Spanish fluently. Um, he's actually in some cases more popular there than he is with the Anglo community. I think the issue for him is a little bit different than sort of the larger question. Um, about the statewide ticket, because you're right, that's been brought up, the fact that there's a lack of fundamental diversity within the ticket. But I do think his ability, I think, to generate um, turnout is is not going to be as much of an issue in large part to what Brandon said. The driver in this race has always been that the president of the United States is Donald Trump. That is what is igniting individuals to come out and vote with the combination of You've had a phenomena of congressional districts that are at play that just have never been at play before. So these, this patchwork of, con- of congressional districts, uh, 32 in Dallas, uh, the Pete Sessions seat, uh, 23 Will Hurd seat down in the Valley, uh, CD7 John Culberson seat, in, in major population centers is causing a, a surge in turnout and interest that, that makes it a little more competitive. I don't think that's as much of an issue from an identity perspective as uh, at least in a general election. We don't have a whole lot of time left, and yet we have to talk about Congressionals 2, uh, 7, and 29. (laughs) Those are our our three. Those are the ones getting all the attention with the ads. Uh, I I noticed that the Chronicle endorsed Kevin Roberts Mm -hmm. rather than Miss Wall, who has the semi-automatic background. They, strangely enough, endorsed Culberson. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe he doesn't have a, uh, an opposition, but they've always been after Culberson with their editorials. And then they uh, endorsed Philip Aronoff uh, and the other congressional race and for Gene Green's seat. Uh, the Chronicle also endorsed Sylvia Garcia in the Democratic side, Todd Litton in Congressional 2, and dual endorsement in uh, seven, uh, Jason Weston and Lizzie Fletcher. Mm. Have any disagreements with the Chronicle's selections? <laughs> I guess I don't disagree, except to say that, you know, it's becoming the more the case that the newspaper editorials are less influential in people's voting. Um, these are some competitive races. I think that in CD7 in particular, it's going to be a national level race. Those Democrats are fighting hard to get a spot. I do think we're going to see a runoff there. And I think Lizzie Fletcher probably is going to win just because she's viewed as the more, pro- more progressive of that group. I think in number two, the uh, and Jay and I have talked about this. Um, I think that Kathleen Wall has given herself a lot of money, so she's able to really run the table in terms of advertisements. But there are some other conservatives in the race that might 
percolate as well. So that likely goes to a runoff, but I think she ends up winning that. Yeah, the larger point you were saying on, on uh, we were talking about earlier on the Chronicle on the Republican side, I, I just don't think their endorsement means much at all. Uh, Kevin Roberts says it, he's likely to finish third or fourth in that race. Um, and Philip Aronoff, while he may or may not win that race, is not really consequential in, in, in the ultimate outcome because it's going to be a, a Democrat going to win. Sylvia Garcia is being challenged in, C, in the CD29. And today uh, we learned that Senator Schumer has decided that someone else should take correct, that. Correct. Right. Yeah, he's, he's endorsed uh, uh, Tahir Javed, her, uh, her opponent, who is a Pakistani-American businessman so very, who's uh, from the Beaumont area, who's moved into the district um, and, and given himself quite a bit of money to run a pretty vigorous race. He's got a little bit of support. Mm -hmm. He might drive her into a runoff, but it's hard to imagine a scenario in which she's not the, uh, the member of Congress from CD29. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I'd have to say that uh, it's a very strange uh, turn of events when uh, Schumer comes to town for a fundraiser thrown by this guy. Yeah. And then he goes back to Washington and all of a sudden decides that, oh, that's my favorite candidate for <laughs> Congressional 29. You that's very interesting. There's a little bit of a, of a, a younger, older dynamic there. A lot of the candidates who are the more established ones and who have the more money, like Garcia and, and, and Javed, like they, best, they have more money and are thought to be kind of the old guard. But there's a group like uh, Raul Garcia and like Hector Morales who are running, who are trying to bring a kind of more Bernie Sanders style progressivism to uh, that District. So I think we will see Garcia win, Sylvia Garcia win. Yeah. There are multiple Garcias There's running. There's three Garcias on the ballot. Sylvia well, Garcia. Yeah. And another one running for commissioner. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's a good one. Adri Adrian running for yeah. commissioner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you guys have been uh, excellent as usual. And uh, all I guess we can say is to everyone out there is to early vote. Make sure you get out and do something. And we will be back next week on Red, White, and Blue.